As anyone who stood in bright light for a while will tell you, our nearest star gives off a lot of thermal radiation. The Earth as a whole receives a gargantuan amount of solar energy. It is constantly being bombarded by high energy photons from the Sun. In fact, in just an hour and a half, the energy striking all parts of the Earth's surface is greater than the power consumed by the entire human race in 2001. And that's just in an hour and a half. This does not include the energy diffused by Earth's cloud layers or the light reflected back into space by the ocean. In fact, we would only need a small fraction of the Algerian desert to power the entire world indefinitely for free if it was covered in solar panels. The discussion as to who would fund that massive endeavor is probably best left to political chambers and houses of parliament. But it cannot be denied that the sun produces gargantuan amounts of energy, more than we could ever use. In addition to this, modern solar panels can't consume all the light that touches them. If they did, they wouldn't be reflective. Currently, the best photovoltaic cells, solar panels, have efficiencies of around 47%, but cells we can readily mass produce have much lower efficiencies, around 25%. That means we have plenty of room to improve. If we were to cover the entire face of Earth with solar panels, we could support another 1,369 Earths beyond our own, each with over 7 billion inhabitants. But if we were really clever and improved our solar panel efficiency to above 50%, we could support more than 2,739. Okay, that's pretty cool. Let's zoom out for a moment. In your mind, picture the Earth's orbit. We are a tiny pea traveling around on a roughly perfect circle around the Sun. Now, revolve that circular orbit into three dimensions, a sphere. How much of that sphere's surface area does our tiny pea cover? I will give you the answer, it's not much. Anyway, this is one second. It's pretty unremarkable. In that second, how much energy did the sun give off? What do you reckon? Enough to power the Earth for a year? Maybe more? Well, in that second, the nuclear fusion in the sun's core output 3.6 by 10 to the 26 joules. That is enough energy to power planet Earth about 760,000 times over, each for a year. Okay, clearly that number isn't big enough so what if we were to constantly harvest the sun's energy? How many planets could we power then? Well, to do this we take 760,000 and we multiply it by the number of seconds in a year, which is pretty big, 31,536,000. The resultant number is unfathomably huge. 23,967,360,000,000. I would ask you to imagine what 24 trillion Earths looks like, but don't bother. It is impossible to visualize a number that huge. And all of this is from one single star, our little old sun. How can we do it? How can we harvest the energy of an entire star? In 1960, an established physicist named Freeman John Dyson wrote a brief paper for the scientific journal Science. In that paper, he postulates and then describes a way to capture the energy of an entire star. One should expect that, within a few thousand years of its entering the stage of industrial development, any intelligent species should be found occupying an artificial biosphere which completely surrounds its parent star. This biosphere has come to be known as a Dyson Sphere, an absolute necessity for up-and-coming species capturing the total solar energy output of a star. In the science paper, Dyson postulates that a sufficiently advanced civilization could, in a reasonable time frame, about, you know, 800 years, disassemble a planet the size of Jupiter and reassemble it into a vast habitable shell that surrounds the entirety of a main sequence star like our own. Dyson then suggests that we might use this to observe intelligent life in the far reaches of the galaxy. Periodic drops in infrared light might indicate that some huge astro-engineering project of another civilization is blocking light coming to us from that star. Since that first pioneering paper, we have refined the concept of Dyson Sphere down to two variants, Type 1 and Type 2. What Dyson was describing in his original paper was a Type 2 Dyson Sphere. 
which is essentially just a thin spherical ball that surrounds the entire star. Unfortunately, recent studies have shown that such a sphere, or even a ring, would tear itself apart under huge gravitational stresses. No, this is not an option, but we still have the other type of Dyson Sphere, Type 1 Dyson Spheres, also known as Dyson Swarms. This sphere is a constellation of tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of huge satellites, each on a perfectly calculated orbit, such that they form a spinning, moving sphere around the host star, an intricate ballet of habitats, solar cells, and industrial plants orbiting independently of each other, but each contributing to a grand superstructure on a stellar scale. Human imagination is limitless, and if we can someday hold the power of stars in our palms, then the energy available to us will be near limitless too. The universe has given us a lot of clever ideas and an infinite sandbox to build them with. All we need now is a fair amount of perseverance and a healthy dose of inspiration, then we can set course for the stars. Hey, do you remember those 24 trillion Earths? That, that's not enough. We can go bigger. Our sun produces a large amount of energy, but it won't do that forever. As our sun ages, it will grow into a red giant, disrupting our carefully crafted sphere of satellites. And in 5 billion years or so, our star will dramatically end its life in a totally rad collapse into a white dwarf, outgassing a huge amount of matter known as a planetary nebula. Five billion years is a long time. It's going to be long after the last human will have passed to the great unknown. But if we're going to make an interstellar civilization, we may as well go big or go home. So, we need a source of energy that will last for quite a long time, even longer than our own sun. How about a brown dwarf? These are failed stars, which have lasted for trillions of years, but they give off so little energy that it's really not worth the effort. How about neutron stars, which are bodies with the mass of a star compressed into a ball only a few kilometers in radius? No, no, the, the biosphere would be too small around them. Maybe a quasar. A quasar is a black hole that streams out massive amounts of energy from its rotational poles. That energy is huge, but it would disrupt any structure we could build around it. Black holes, however, are a good choice because they emit energy for trillions and trillions of years and will likely be the last thing to go before the universe succumbs to heat death, the maximum entropy state of everything. Look, up in the night sky, is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, it's the Milky Way, a galactic superstructure made of stars, interstellar dust, and probably a fair bit of dark matter, whatever that is. And all of it is rotating around one black hole, the supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A star. Oh yes, that is going to be our interstellar energy source. Sagittarius A star is a black hole and black holes don't actually emit a lot of useful radiation. I mean, technically speaking, they produce Hawking radiation, and they produce quite a lot of it, but that's, that's piddly compared to the energy that we're talking about in terms of stars and stuff. Anyway, instead, huge masses such as planets and stars are sucked towards the center of the black hole, being stretched and crushed into a huge disk called an accretion disk. The matter in this disk subject to the tidal forces of the black hole, has gargantuan frictional forces applied to it, slowly spiraling the matter lower and lower towards the black hole's event horizon. In essence, the gravitational potential energy of these crushed stars is being transformed into radiation that is escaping the accretion disk. Gravitational potential energy is dependent on the mass of the objects, and because Sagittarius A star is so huge, a whole galaxy rotates around it, there is a ton of potential energy being lost, which means lots and lots and lots of radiation is being emitted at all times from the system, mostly in the form of visible light. So, when I say lots of energy, I mean a whole new scale beyond the unfathomably huge scales we have already discussed. Estimates say that a supermassive black hole like Sagittarius A star could output up to 10 to the 45 ergs per second, or 10 to the 38 joules per second, which is 10 to the 11 times more than our star's total energy output. 
10 to the 11 is 100 billion times greater than our sun. Which, I will remind you, could sustain 24 trillion Earths on its own. All told, the supermassive black hole Sagittarius A star, which is quite a mouthful, could sustain 2.4 times 10 to the 24 Earths, each with 7 billion inhabitants. For the worldly among you, that is 24 octillion, or 24 million 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 Earths, each with the cultural diversity of the 7 billion inhabitants we have today. This is unfathomably huge. These numbers exist beyond our comprehension, but not beyond our ambition. We are a funny little species of monkey, one that always has to build a taller tower. As time goes on and we become too smart for our own good, we'll build saddles on the stars that we once gazed up at. The burning friction of an accretion disk will light the lives of trillions. It will fund early mornings, late nights, and love stories under alien skies. Because, look, I can talk all I want about gravity, the speed of light, infrared radiation, and quantum physics, but at the end of the day, this structure would not be a story of a minute nor the supermassive. It will be a story about us, just another tool to face down the universe. Hi guys, it's the narrator here. If you enjoyed the video, make sure that you like, and if you want to follow us on more adventures into paranormal and weird things, then subscribe. Thank you very much for watching, and goodbye.